good to see you tonight. <laughs> and uh, God bless you for being here Monday night. That's wonderful. I appreciate that introduction. And I thought maybe I should start uh, taping those introductions and pass them to the preachers I'm going to preach at next so they get an idea what they should be saying maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, Sometimes you don't know what to say, but I did, I did have one thing. I hope this doesn't sound like it's a cut on, on uh, Pastor Sulian because I, I sure admire and love him so much. But I wondered tonight if, son, if Monday Night Football had the uh, Broncos on it, uh, if we'd be having church. I, just a thought, just something that crossed my mind. And it, it went, yeah, okay, it, it, it went right through and continued on. So anyway. <laughs> Oh, thank you for being here. I love uh, uh, Missionary Loray. I love that thought. Uh, her uh, presentation about children, that they should be seen and not heard. Love that. And uh, she should come to my house for a while and uh, straighten my kids out. That's great. Amen. Well, I'll take your Bibles tonight, John chapter 5. John chapter 5. And uh, I'm going to read to you tonight the first nine verses in John chapter 5. And uh, we'll see what the Lord has for us in this evening. John chapter 5, stand with me, if you will. And I'm going to begin reading to you in verse number 1. John 5 and verse number 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue uh, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Keep that in mind, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? And the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. And Jesus saith unto him, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. I call your attention into verse number 7 where the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. I want to preach you tonight on the subject, putting people into the pool. Putting people into the pool. This is a great Monday night crowd. I appreciate you being here on a Monday night. And thank God for you being here. And I know it's an encouragement to your pastor. And uh, let's just ask God to work in our lives tonight. Father, help us. As we look to the Word of God, we are not uh, uh, claiming to uh, come here without a purpose. We have a purpose. We have a reason. You've given a, a message, and now the people are ready to hear and receive that message. And I pray, Lord, that nothing would hinder us in that delivery of that message, that nothing that happens tomorrow or plans or activities for tonight or things that we're going through, the burdens or trials of life, would enter into our minds in this time. But instead, we just divorce ourselves of everything in life and focus on the things of heaven. Help us tonight that we'd not miss what the Spirit has to say to this church. And Holy Spirit of God, I yield for the power of God to preach tonight. Let it not fall on deaf ears or hardened hearts, but let it come on fertile ground. Help us tonight together that we would hear the Word of God and do it. For Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here in John chapter number 5, there's an ongoing miracle taking place in this pool called Bethesda. At a particular unknown time, an angel would go into the pool and stir the waters of this pool, causing the first one to step in after the waters were stirred to be healed of whatever they had. Whatever disease or sickness they had, the first one in got the healing. Now, this was a very well-known miracle to the people of this place. So much so that the Bible says that there was a great multitude of people that were laying around the pool. They were waiting for the moving of the waters. Now, here's what's interesting to me, because the Bible specifically uses the term multitude. 
And what we understand about the word multitude, it can be a, a general number, but it, ge it generally is in the numbers of hundreds and even thousands. For example, in Luke chapter 9, the same word multitude is used to describe the amount of people that Jesus fed with the loaves and fishes. Well, you know the story. Jesus fed 5,000 men beside women and children, and the Bible calls them a multitude. So of the group of people that are around the pool of Bethesda, it could be hundreds, but it may very well be thousands of people who are there waiting for the waters to be moved. And not only do perhaps these thousands of people are sitting at this pool, but the word lay is found here, and it signifies that they are encamped there. This is their home. This is where they reside. Because if they were to leave this for any reason, it may be the very moment when the angel came in and troubled the waters. They had no idea. There was no forewarning. There was nothing that told them the angel is coming in the next five minutes or the next five hours. So they had to stay. If they wanted the healing, they had to lay by that pool until the angel came down. So not only are they waiting, but they are spending their lives waiting. They are doing nothing but waiting. And here in our scriptures, we have the story of a man who has waited for 38 years. Now, this guy isn't 38 years old. He's been waiting for 38 years for this healing. He's got some disease, and it's not gone away. It may have been that he, like the woman with the issue of blood, had spent all his life on doctors and tried to get healed of all them and never got healed. So he goes to what is he told him that there's this miracle takes place at Bethesda, and if you just show up there and wait, maybe you'll be the first one in the water. So he spends 38 years of his life laying by this pool and does not get the healing. So notice what he said, his hindrance as to why in 38 years he was not healed. He said in our text, verse, verse 7, the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. So he's seen the, the healings before. How many he's seen, we don't know. But he has, had tried to get in there. He wanted to get in there. He desired to get in there. But there was no man who would help him. He can't walk. There's no man that will help him get into the water. Now, I think of this uh, issue of no man like the Ethiopian eunuch said. Because when Philip the evangelist confronted the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8 and verse 31, he, verse 30 and then verse 31, he said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? So here's a guy who's laying by the pool of Bethesda waiting for the moving of the waters, but he can't get in. Because no man will help him. And here's the Ethiopian eunuch who's reading the scriptures and is trying to get an understanding of what it's all about. And he says, how can I except some man should guide me? You getting the idea? So here's a situation in, in John chapter number 5 where thousands are waiting for something to happen that only one's going to get. And it literally is thousands of people who desire it who need it, who want it, but never get it. They die without it. And even the main character of the story, had Jesus not shown up and Jesus had healed him himself, that man may well have died and never had his healing. So there they lay, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, waiting for the moving of the waters so that somebody could put them in the pool. I want you to listen to me carefully tonight because the miracle at the pool of Bethesda is long since forgotten. And in fact, if you didn't read through John 5, you may not even have paid attention to it. But I tell you tonight that the need of people who are spiritually blind, spiritually halt, and spiritually withered is still in our midst. That need is still here. They don't lay by a pool any longer, but they're still waiting for the moving of the waters so some man can put them in the pool. Somebody has to get involved. Somebody has to go. Somebody has to take the gospel and put them in the pool of salvation or they're not getting healed of what they got. 
The only problem is there's few people these days that are putting people in the pool, pool anymore. And the biggest need of every man was the biggest need of that man. He said, sir, I have no man to put me in the pool. You see, the moving of the water that was done by the angel is not done by angels anymore. It's done by God's people, endued by the Holy Spirit of God, when they take the Word of God and go out in the communities and give the gospel to people. That's when you put them in the pool of salvation. And even though they're not physically halt or physically uh, struggling or physically, they are spiritually in that condition. Because everyone without Christ is spiritually in that condition. Amen. It reminds us tonight that there are still many on the sides waiting for somebody to put them in the pool. They're living in that spiritual halt, withered and blind condition, waiting for the moving of the water. And somebody needs to go and put them out of their heavenly abode and put them in the pool that they might be born again. The healing of heaven needs to be done in their lives. But who will go? Can I tell you that there are many, many people that you will not have to wrestle this unto. You won't have to fight them and argue with them. They are tonight sitting at home, even in Longmont, Colorado, and they're wanting somebody to knock on their door or give them a track or talk to them about Jesus. They don't know how to get to heaven. They don't understand how to get there. It's not in the newspapers. It's not on Facebook clearly in their, their area. It's not what they see on TV, but you know the truth. Somebody has to put them in the pool. They're tonight not wanting to argue with you. They're not wanting to fight. They don't want to cuss you out. They want to know. That's right. How do you go to heaven? That's right. When I started preaching out as a pastor, back in the 90s, I, I, I started going out a lot, and I started feeling bad for my wife and my children at home because I wasn't there. <laughs> and I thought I should get a security system for them. We lived out in the country. But I was more concerned, not even just for the safety and the security aspect of the house, but I was concerned about fire. And I thought, if I get a security system that has security for the windows, doors, and so forth, but also has fire alarms, then I might help my family in my absence. And so I called the Guardian Security System, the nationally known company, and I made an appointment to have one of their salesmen come, see what it's going to cost to put a Guardian system in my house. Well, it was very inexpensive, and mostly it was the monthly, monthly amount. You got to pay for the service, but uh, it wasn't a, a great deal. But the, the man began to talk, and he, he talked a lot about security. It was everything about being secure and being safe and, and making sure you don't have to worry about stuff. And, you know, this automatically goes to the police department if you get our service. And, and this signal will automatically go to the fire department if this happens in your house, and you'll be safe and you'll be secure. And he kept saying that over and over again. And I thought about security. And I let this man give me his spiel, and I was signing up for it anyway, so he didn't even have to sell me on it. And I signed all the documents, and we got done with everything. He was putting everything away, and I said, now let me ask you a question. I said, you've talked to me about the security of my home. Let me talk to you about the security of your soul. And he said, what do you mean? I said, you know for sure when you die you're going to heaven? He said, oh, I don't know that. I said, then you have no security for your soul. He said, I guess I don't. I said, can I take a Bible and show you how you can know that? He said, you know, listen, he said, you know what? He said, my wife and I at dinner last night talked about that very thing. We said to each other, we don't know anybody that knows whether there's a heaven or whether you can get there. We don't even know what to do about it. I said, let me show you what the Bible says. And you know, he wasn't arguing with me and cussing me out and mad at me. He sat there, wrapped attention on those scriptures. I started at Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, and then moved to Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, and then Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the first half, and then I skipped over there to Romans 5, 8, and then I pulled him back to Romans 6, 23, and then I put into there Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. Hey, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Yes. Do you believe that if you pray, you can receive him as Savior? The Bible's true? Yes. Yes, and right there he trusted Christ as Savior. He walked out with security for his soul. Amen. And you say, what's that called? That's called putting people in the pool. That's what it is. It's putting people in the pool. I'm telling you tonight, you don't have to go and argue with people. You oh, I'm afraid to go. I don't know what to tell. You don't have to know what to tell nobody. Anybody wants to argue, give them a track, move on. You're not there to be a theologian and debate with people. You're there to put them in the pool. That's what you're there for. And if they don't want it, move on. 
because there's somebody that does want it. You say, well, that's easy. You're a preacher. You do that for a living. <laughs> before I ever went to Bible college, before I even knew I was called to preach, I was a layman. I was married. We didn't have any kids. It's hard for me with 12 kids to remember a day when I had no kids. It really is hard. But we did. When we were first married, we obviously had no kids. And so uh, we, it was a Thursday night. My wife had done one of these things years ago. This is the way it was because they didn't have Internet. And, uh, yes, I am that old. Uh, I was alive before Internet. Um, but she read a, a ladies' magazine, Pastor, and, and in the ladies' magazine, it said, if you want a free set of, of steak knives, you know, fill this out, send it in. Well, it was to Encyclopedia Britannica. So she did not read the fine print that means it comes to your house with a salesperson. That's how you get it. And so uh, we're, we're both dressed, ready to go out soul winning with our church. And it's Thursday night. We're walking out the door, and there's a knock on the front door. And here's the Encyclopedia Britannica sales lady. And she says to me, she says, I'm here with your, uh, your steak knives. I'm here to deliver your steak knives and show you what we got from the Encyclopedia Britannica. I had no children, and at the time, I had no money. Now, when some people say they have no money, you open their wallet, they got $100 in there. When I say I had no money, I meant I had no money. None. I, I, I was poor as, as our Spanish pastor back here is. <laughs> uh, so... I said, uh, uh, ma'am, I said, I, I appreciate you bringing it, but I don't have time for that presentation. We're getting ready to go out the door. And she said, can I come tomorrow night? And I said, okay, because I knew my wife wanted those knives. <laughs> okay. And as she turned to leave, listen, there's times when this happens. I wish it was every time. It's not. But the, it was like the Holy Spirit said, if you'll talk to her, she'll get saved. If you'll talk to her, she'll get saved. And I told my wife, we got in the car, and we headed to the church to get ready to go soul winning with the church. And I said, you know, I feel like if I just talk to her tomorrow night, she's going to get saved. Well, all right, we'll get knives and salvation out of the way. <laughs> that lady came the next night. Man, she had her satchel. She had a professional outfit. I mean, she was dressed sharp. And, uh, I mean, encyclopedias shouldn't have been what she was selling. She should have selling much more than that, you know. And she was all professional. And she come in and she put that display on and opened the books. And it's hard to imagine when you got the Internet now what it really was like with books. But that's what it was, you know, paper and bindings and, and you know, encyclopedias. And I didn't have any kids. And I had no reason for it. I wasn't going in the ministry. I mean, I didn't think any reason. And she's, boy, she's good at this. So she's got a flip chart, and this, is, and this is how much it costs, and you can learn this, and you can do this. And, I, you know, she finished and did a great job. I said, listen, I said, I appreciate everything you just did, but I don't have any money. Honestly, it's only $30 a month. That's in 1978, nine, 79, $30 a month is like $300 a month now. No, I didn't have that. I said, I, I'm sorry. I said, I should have probably just stopped you. You know, I, I knew there was no way we could do anything. And, oh, she said, well, it's just good to meet nice people. And I thought, you're lying through your teeth. <laughs> you're trying to sell stuff. You don't want to meet nice people. But so she's packing herself up. And I said, can I ask you a question while you're packing? She said, sure. I said, you know, for sure, if you died right now, you'd go to heaven. She stopped packing. She looked at me like this. And she said, can I use your phone? I never had that as a response before. That was an interesting one. I said, yes. She got off the chair and went over to the wall where the phone was attached to the wall with a cord on it. This is such an education for young people. I can see these young guys going, what? <laughs> and she called up her roommate and she said this to her. She said, I'm going to be late coming home. Bang. She turned around, sat down, and she says, no, I don't know if I'm going to heaven or not. And I did the same thing, the same thing you do, the same thing your pastor does every day of the year, the same thing God wants us to do, and just open the scriptures. I didn't have to argue with her. I didn't have to fight with her. I didn't have to beg her. She was ready to get put in the pool. She just needed some man to do it. That's all she needed. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why we're here tonight. This is why there's a Hopewell Baptist Church in Longmont. This isn't here so this church can win community awards. This church isn't here so we can shine and look at us and what do we got and look at what we are and how long we've been here. 
This church has services. This church has Sunday school uh, classes. This church has bus routes. This church has a Spanish church. This church has soul winning because it's time to put people in the pool before Jesus gets here. That's what the church is all about. You're sitting in a church that teaches soul winning, preaches soul winning, loves soul winning, prays about soul winning, encourages soul winning, believes in soul winning, and has the most soul winning pastor in America. Hey, there is no reason under heaven you're not a soul winner. Yeah, man. Are you going? Do you take those tracks and use them? Do you go in the appointed soul winning times? Oh, you to, well, I'm not a, uh, ordained. You don't have to be ordained. You just have to be saved. So all you got to be is saved. That's all you got to be. And I wonder if you are going, are you really going fully putting people in the pool? I mean, here's the thing about it. It's one thing to get them saved. It's another thing to get them to church, down the aisle, in that baptistry, and then keep bringing them back so they can learn all the things you know. That's what we affectionately call the Great Commission, which now in the independent Baptist movement has become the Great Omission. Because who's doing it? We're storing our Christmas decorations in the baptistry these days because there's no other place to put them. And it's out of the way, you know. Nobody can see it. It's a shame. It's a shame because there are people that aren't being saved, and then there are people who are getting saved, but nobody cares for them. And the, uh, the, here come the Jehovah Witnesses who say the best people they ever get are the former Baptists. We're leaving them for the wolves. We should be after them and getting them to church and putting them down the aisle and baptized and then teaching them all things whatsoever God's taught us. That is the command that the church is supposed to fall under. Someone is on their way to hell tonight and unless you are willing to put them in the pool, that may not make a difference. They may never get saved. And if you think they're going to get saved whether you get involved or not, you might as well trot yourself to a Calvinist church because that's what you believe. Have we forgotten there's a hell? Have we forgotten that people tonight are in hell? I tell you tonight, the lifeblood of the church starting in the book of Acts, proved in the book of Acts, is putting people in the pool. For 30 years, I would refuse to pastor people that wouldn't go soul winning or be a pastor of a church that refused it. And I never had that problem. They wanted it. But I'm telling you, these are the last of the last days, and that's not the common thing anymore. It's not common for people to go soul winning. It's not common for people to get the tracks out. It's not common for people to bring people to church. They're just kind of riding out till the rapture takes place. And it's a shame because there are people dying in their sins. Do you know there's a good many churches and Bible colleges that are living off their past reputation of being soul winning citadels, but they don't do a thing for it now. I know one particular southern church that for many years baptized upwards to 10,000 converts, and now this year they'll baptize possibly 100 of them. Riding off the past reputations. But I believe the objective of the last of the last days is to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is putting people in the pool. That's what the main thing is. It's not how big our building is. It's not how pretty we are. It's not how many we even have. It's whether or not we're doing what Jesus brought us here to do. Whether we're getting the gospel out and being faithful and making sure that people not only know, but they're being helped and loved and discipled and baptized and growing in the Lord. That's what it's about. I ask you tonight, if you know your area, who in this area is actually putting people in the pool beside you. I mean, is it, is it really a thing where you're bumping into people when you're out there? you got to go back 40 years before you find churches bumping into each other out on the, on the, on the streets. Many visit the pool, but few are there all the time. I was asked one time to, and I was still pastoring, and I was asked one time to preach a, at a, a preacher's fellowship, which are always a lot of fun to preach at. <laughs> Usually they get mad at you. And I, I'm trying to be belligerent, but... <clears throat> so it was, it was this Friday after Easter. And in our county, 300,000 people, there are 13 independent Baptist churches then, and they asked me to preach to the other 12 guys. Well, that's great, that's fine. They picked a church, to, to, we had a breakfast, and went there. And, uh, and so they were standing around after the breakfast before the service started, and the guys were talking about their Easter Sunday service. They said, oh, man, 
great attendance. And the guy said, I had three saved and one baptized. Wow, that's great. And the guy said, I had two saved and had one baptized. And I said, I had five saved and had two baptized. And they're going around there in town. And what'd you do? And how'd that go? And man, that was great. And everybody, three, one, two, five. And, and they said, we, you know, we haven't had anybody baptized in six months. We had two baptized on Easter Sunday. Boy, we were really excited about that. And then they came to me. I had 848 that day. I had 46 baptized and 15, or 46 saved and 15 baptized in the service, and I didn't want to tell them. <laughs> See, there's some, there's some independent Baptist churches, they'll visit the pool on Easter. But the rest of the year, everybody can die and go to hell as far as they're concerned. Aren't you glad you got a pastor that doesn't believe that way? I don't know about you, but if you haven't been thanking God for your pastor, I think you ought to be on your face every day thanking God and saying, hey, I don't have a dead pastor who doesn't care about souls. I got one that proves he cares about souls. Putting people in the pool. That's what, hey, we got to do everything we can before the time is over. Everything we can. You know one of the greatest soul winners I ever went soul winning with was Dr. Monty Watts. Brother Watts is in heaven now. And, uh, but he was, a, he was a soul winner who learned about life by reading. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. I preached with him in a, in a conference one time, and we had dinner over at the pastor's house, and uh, all the preachers of the conference and pastor and his family, and he started showing us things that I had never heard of before, like he'd pick up the fork. He said, you know where the fork came from? And he began to give me an illustration of where the fork came from and the year it was invented and who started it with it first and what country it came from. It's like, really? I had never heard that before. Then he picked up the salt chicken. You know where salt, table salt came from? And he started on that. And, 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 and then he moved to the napkin and the plate. And I mean, he knew everything. Now, he could have been lying about all of it. I wouldn't have known. I had no idea when any of this stuff started. I couldn't have told him. But we literally, we were roaring in laughter because he was like Mr. Encyclopedia Britannica, you know. And he had all these things figured out, you know. So a couple of years went by, and I was preaching at another conference with him. And one of the things that the pastor of the church we were at in the conference wanted to do is want to take everybody out and have a soul winning time. And so we all got on a bus, went out for a soul winning time during the conference, and, uh, and the pastor paired me up with Brother Watts. And so I said to Brother Watts, I said, let's just, you know, every other door. We are in an affluent neighborhood, nice neighborhood, nice homes. Most of the people wouldn't open the door as soon as they saw us, you know. And uh, <clears throat> so every other door, I'll do one, you do one. Okay. And that's what we're doing. So it was my turn. We walked this driveway, and the guy is in his garage. The door's open. His garage is filled with trains. I mean filled with trains. Every inch of it's a train. And that guy's standing in the center of it like, you know, engineer hat and Mr. Engineer. And <clears throat> I mean, it's really, really a neat layout. And, and the whole garage, two and a half car garage, the whole thing is trains. And so I'm standing on the outside there and I've got a track from the church. Hey, how you doing today? And uh, this is uh, Monty Watts and I'm Jeff Smith. Listen, we're from the Heritage Baptist Church and we're out inviting folks to come visit our church. And I got a track about, oh, I don't want to hear anything about the church. Well, well, wait a minute. Now, I just want to leave it with you. Is that okay? No, I'm busy. I don't want to hear anything about the church. And I said, well, can I just leave it here on your... Don't leave it on my train track. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> have a good day. And I turned around to walk away. Brother Watts stepped up there, pointed to one of the cars on the track, and he said, sir, he said, is that a, an end scale Lionel train right there? And that guy stopped the train. He said, well, yes, how'd you know that? He said, I know something about trains. He said, do you like trains? He said, yeah. Brother Watts said, I like trains. And they talked for 15 minutes about trains, model railroading. And, I mean, they were sharing things about tracks and setups and layouts. And I'm just standing outside the garage with my mouth open. How does he know these things? He wins the guy to the Lord. The guy wouldn't even take a track from me. But Mr. Train got him to get to the gospel. We walked away from there, and I said, Brother Watts, <laughs> I said, you got a train track at your house? He said, no. I said, did you when you were a kid? He said, no. I said, are you planning to get one? He said, no. I said, how do you know so much about trains then? He said, I read up on them. I said, wait a minute. <clears throat> you don't have a train. You never had a train. You don't plan on having a train. 
But you read up on model railroading? Why? And this is what he said. He said, because I believe that one day I would come across somebody who needed to hear the gospel and I needed to talk about trains. Oh, my soul. If I could have that good, good of a burden for souls, that I would read books to learn about something I didn't even care about ever having myself, so I'd have an inroad to witness to somebody. Don't you know God used that? I'm telling you tonight, we've got to pull the stops out. We've got to decide it's time to put the people in the pool like it is. The main thing of every born-again Christian is to put people. I've already told you, if you think the main thing is for you to praise God, you're missing it. Yes, you're supposed to praise God, but you'll praise him better in heaven than you ever will down here. If you think the main thing you're supposed to do down here is worship God, yes, you should worship him, but you'll never worship him as well as you can in heaven. But the main thing that you can do here that you'll never do in heaven is get people in the pool. That's the thing you can do. I ask you tonight, what good is it to labor fervently for the Lord if your labor isn't centered on the eternal souls of mankind? What good is it to separate ourselves from this untoward generation and, and dress in modest apparel and hate even the garments spotted with the stain of sin if we're not going to be concerned with putting people in the pool? What good is it tonight to be able to spot the false teachers and the false doctrines that are on Facebook and on the Internet if we're not actively engaged and keep on people out of hell? What good is it that we know that? Amen. What good is it that we don't quit our works for Christ if our works don't have a foundation for the souls of mankind? What good is it that we can do those things? I'm glad you work hard. I'm glad you hate sin. I'm glad you're separated. I'm glad you know the truth about the religious world. I'm glad that you serve the Lord. But I ask you tonight, are you putting people in the pool? Why do you think there's a missions conference in your church? Because they need to get in the pool beyond Colorado. Yes, sir. Last time I checked, you live in this area. You're not going anywhere else, more than likely. But there's somebody you can support that is. Why not help them? If they're going to put people in the pool, give them some money. Get them out there and pray for them. And let them cut them loose and let them have it so they can do a work for God. Brother, if you have no heart for putting people in the pool, then what good is anything else we're doing? What do we know about this from Luke chapter 19 and verse 10? The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Yes, sir. He did not say the Son of Man has come so we can clothe everybody, and I'm not against it. He did not say the Son of Man has come to feed everybody, and I'm not against that. We're way too overweight now, but I'm not against it. He did not say the Son of Man has come to see what kind of house we can build and whether we can have utilities and, and free internet and, and uh, iPhone. He said he's come to seek and save that which was lost. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 10 and verse 1, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer for God, uh, for Israel, is that they might be saved. He didn't say they might be happy. He said they might be saved. He didn't say they might be rich. He said they might be saved. He didn't say they might be prosperous. He said they might be saved. He didn't say they might be well-known. He didn't say they might be saved. He didn't say they're self-sufficient. He said that they might be saved. That's what his heart and desire and prayer was. Amen. They might be saved probably 20 years ago now, <clears throat> one of the men in my church, the young men went into the military. They stationed him in Germany. And while he was stationed in Germany, he fell in love with a German girl. And uh, he called me on the phone. He said, preacher, he said, I've met this girl by the name of Barbara. He said, Barbara, wonderful girl. She knows very little English. And, uh, and yet, I don't think she's safe. I'm bringing her to the States to meet my family. I'm bringing her to church. Would you try and win her to Christ? I said, yeah, I'd be glad to. He said, I, I, I can't go any further with her unless I know she's saved. And I can't tell because I don't know any, a, a German enough to be able to understand whether she is or not. And so I'm going to bring her to church. And if you can talk with her afterwards, I'd be grateful that we could know for sure that she's saved. I said, okay, Barbara sat in all the way in the back, and I'm preaching away, and she's just looking at me like, I've never seen anything like this in my life, you know, that, that, that uh, deer in the headlights look that <laughs> first-timers have, you know, when they come to church. <clears throat> so after the service, I brought her up, and, and her and her uh, boyfriend, Ron, from our church, into my office over there, 
and sat her down. And I said, Ron, I said, uh, you think she's understood the preaching? And he said, well, she mentioned to me that you preach real fast. So she didn't pick everything up. I said, okay, in my mind, I'm saying, I got to slow down. I got to slow down. And so I said to her, Barbara, I started talking like this. I said, Barbara, in my office, <clears throat> I want to show you what the Bible says about going to heaven. And she's looking at me like, why is he talking like this, you know? <laughs> I'll show you verses from the New Testament of the Bible. And I started, Romans chapter 3. There is none righteous, Barbara, no, not one. <laughs> Just look at that, you know. I'm halfway through the Romans road, and it dawns on me. She's German, not deaf. You don't have to yell at her. <laughs> the weirdest things. <laughs> so I calmed down and started, still kept it slow, but, you know, I went through the whole thing. I made sure she understood what I was saying, that <clears throat> she comprehended it. You believe the Bible's true? Yes. <clears throat> you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Yes. If I led you in a sinner's prayer, would you be willing to pray and from your heart ask Jesus to save you? She said yes, and she did in my office. But let me tell you, <clears throat> I know feelings are not a part of faith. I know, I preach that. I've preached it here already. I've said that. But you know when you win people to Christ, you like to see something out of them when you're done. You know, a smile, you know, a tear, a thank you, something. I finished with the gospel. She finished praying. I looked at her, and she just looked at me like this. You know the first thing I had? This is horrible. I'm a preacher. You know the first thing I had in my mind? She didn't get it. Not a tear, not a smile, not a thank you, not a grunt, nothing. She didn't get it. <clears throat> Somehow she didn't get it. <clears throat> she went back over to Germany. Three months passed. <clears throat> I got called in my office. My secretary says, there's a missionary from Germany calling. Hmm, I don't know many missionaries from Germany. Did he call me by name? That's usually a key, whether they call me by name or not. Yeah, he asked for you by name. Okay, let me take the call. I got on the phone, and he said, Dr. Smell, he said, <clears throat> he said uh, I know you don't know me. I'm a, an independent Baptist missionary in Germany. He said, but I've got a lady who's been coming to my church for a month by the name of Barbara Wurstberger. I said, really? I said, yes. He said, yes. And he said, uh, she looked us up. She said to me, because I talked to her, she came forward in a service recently and said she wanted to get baptized. And I said, she did, Yes. And I asked her about being saved, and she said, you led her to Christ in the United States. And I said, well, that's true. I did. Well, she's been started going out with our soul winning group, and she came forward and said, I haven't been baptized. I need to be. I said, how'd she find you? She said to me, this German missionary said, that <clears throat> she was in an independent Baptist church. She got saved in an independent Baptist church, and she looked for one in Germany, and she found me. And here she was, three months later, coming to church, Starting to go out so many and wanting to be baptized. <laughs> she did get it. Hey, she got it. She got in the pool. What was I doubting? A couple months after that, it was Christmas. I got a Christmas card from Barbara. And here's what it was. I still kept this card. It said, thank you for showing me Jesus. She said, this is the first Christmas that I understand what it's all about. Now, <clears throat> Had her boyfriend not cared for her soul, that story never would have been given. Somebody's got to care. Amen. Somebody's got to want to get them in the pool. Yes, sir. We, cannot, we cannot afford another independent fundamental Baptist church to sit on their hands and wait for the rapture to happen. We can, listen, this city can't afford it. This state can't afford it. This country can't afford it. We cannot afford another one like that. We need people who are actively putting people into the pool. You be honest tonight. Is soul winning a real priority with you? Be honest. Is getting people to church a priority for you? Is getting people baptized a priority? Is making sure they learn what you've learned a priority? Or is it just a passing fancy that you're glad your pastor does it, but, you know, he gets paid for it? Is that what you think? 
It may have been you've lost your first love. That's what Revelation 2 talks about. And 3, you lost your first love. It's time to get it back tonight. I'll give you one more illustration that we need to do business with God. Years ago, back in the early 2000s, <clears throat> I started gaining people who lived an hour away from our church. I couldn't imagine that they won't drive and hear me an hour away every service, but they did. And first it was one family, and then a second family, and they told somebody about it, and they come, and there was a third family, and a fourth, we had 35 people driving an hour one way to church three times a week. But they were not people that just got saved last week, or people that were just playing church. They were obviously an hour drive. They were serious. And they already had standards, and they'd been saved, and they already knew how to be soul winners. And they were coming three times a week, an hour one way. So this went on for a couple of months like this as they were coming in. And finally, one of them came to me, and they said, Pastor, <clears throat> we want to go soul winning, but, man, we just can't come another night. It's just too much to drive this. And, you know, we got two hours of driving every time we come here, and we can't move here. So what can we do to go soul winning? Perhaps we could do something on Sunday afternoon." Because we stayed, that what they did, they'd come in Sunday morning for Sunday school, they stayed all day. In the afternoon, they'd go out to eat, and then they'd just come and rest at the church until it was time. I said, maybe we could do something on Sunday. Now, they asked me, can you set a time for us? 35 of them. Hmm, well, I'm sure I'm not going to say no. <laughs> but I didn't know exactly what to do. So that week, I mean, starting on Tuesday that week, a guy from a, 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 a like a, a um, oh, Salvation Army type place. It was called, in our area, it's called Love Incorporated. It's a Christian-based place, but they deal with uh, clothing and food and housing and, uh, and furniture and utilities, things like that. So he called on the phone, and the secretary told me, he called for me, and I said, well, what does he want? And she said, I don't know. I said, well, just take a message. I'll call him back. And, uh, and took a message, and the next day he called me again and asked to take five minutes of my time on the phone. I said, well, I'm probably not going to get rid of this guy if I don't talk to him. So a lot of times these people call and they want either money to support them. I'm not against them. I'm glad they do what they do, but that's not what we do. We're not here to clothe people. We're here to get people in the pool and let them clothe the people. Let the dead bury the dead, and then we'll go do the things that living people do. And uh, so I'm not against them. They can do it, but I'm not going to give them money to do it. I need to get buses on the road, and I need to get you know, things done for the Lord in eternity. And so if he's asking me for money, I'm not going to do it. And uh, so finally, you know, okay, this has been the second or third time, I'll talk with him. So I took the phone call, and he got on the phone, and he said, listen, he said, uh, <clears throat> he said, I am an assistant pastor of an independent Baptist church in town here. Called the name of the church, I knew it. And uh, he said, that's my part-time job. The other time, the other part-time, I am the director of furniture distribution at Love Incorporated. He said, here's what we do. We take furniture, and we take it over to people who have requested. They request a couch. They request a bed. They request a chair, and they're uh, under the poverty income level. And we'll take it to them free of charge. I'm thinking, okay, he wants furniture. <laughs> he wants me to donate furniture to him. And uh, he said, so the reason I'm calling you is important. He said, believe me, I'm not asking for any money, and I don't need any furniture. <laughs> he said, can I come to your office? I still hesitate. Okay. We'll meet. We set up a time the next day. That's, this is it's still in the same week since they asked me for a Sunday soul winning time. Still in the same week. The guy came to my office. He sat across from me in the desk, and he said this to me. He said, I am burdened as an independent Baptist that we're taking furniture to lost people and never giving gospel to them. He said, now I am prohibited by this organization, which is Christian-based, in giving tracts and trying to witness these people. He said, but you're not prohibited from it. He said, what I want to do is I want to give you the sheet with the addresses and names and phone numbers of the people that we're going to take furniture to the next week, give it to you, and have your people go out and witness to them. I said, really? Yes. I said, what are the requirements? What are the restrictions? He said, there's none. I said, can we give them our tracks? Yes. I said, if we win them to Christ, can we get them to our church? Yes. I said, can we get them baptized here? Yes, they're yours. He said, all I'm going to do is give you a sheet ahead of time. We'll have a sheet for the week of furniture we're going to give out to the addresses. He said, it might be 25, 30 different people. And he said, I'm going to get it to you before we, we take the furniture. And you make visits on these people and try and win them to Christ. And whatever happens, you got them. I said, I'll do it. I can't beat that. <laughs> I'll do it. I said, I'm, I'm very curious. 
I said, why'd you choose our church? I mean, there's 13 independent Baptist churches in this county. Why'd you choose? He said, let me tell you the story. He said, I, every morning I got a cup of coffee before I go to work, and I go out and get the newspaper, and I, I'm always out there at the time your church bus goes by our house. And I look at that church bus, Victory Baptist Temple, and I think, huh, that church is still after souls. What a great thing. He said, that wasn't enough, though. He said, one Tuesday night, there was a group of your people in a bus that came on my street. And two teenage boys knocked on my door. He said, they were sharp, they were clean, they were all dressed up, no nose rings, studs, tongue rings, tattoos. He said, just sharp young guys and very articulate. And they talked to me, and I told them, I'm an assistant pastor of an independent Baptist church, believe just like your church. And the guy said, the teenager said, okay, but do you know for sure if you died, you'd go to heaven? <laughs> he said, I told him again, I'm a, an assistant pastor of an independent Baptist. He said, I understand what you said, but do you know for sure you're going to heaven? He said, I was so tickled inside that this young guy did not care what I did for a living. He wanted to make sure I was going to heaven. And I said to myself right then and there, I've got somebody that needs to be going after these people that are getting furniture. And I said, okay, I like that. We'll do it. And he left my office. I said, now, Lord, how in the world are we going to fit this into all the other soul winning schedules we got? And it dawned on me. I got 35 people on Sunday afternoon needing something to do. We started household soul winning. Household soul winning. They got that sheet, they divided up, they got in their cars, and they started winning people and bringing them back on Sunday nights. <laughs> Say, well, how do you do stuff like that? It's just when you get known as putting people in the pool, God starts bringing that to you. Amen. Because he doesn't have too many people doing that. You're not one of ten churches in this area that's winning souls. You're one of only one. Yeah, there might be other places in other churches if they came to church and went forward and said, what must I do to get saved? They may say that, but they're not after them. As far as they're concerned, the people of Longmont, Colorado can lay by the pool the rest of their life and die in their sin. But there ought to be one church, and I believe there is one, called Hopewell Baptist that won't let that happen. Not on their watch. And not only should you be after it, but you should do all you can to give and support so these missionaries can get out here. You heard what she said. 2023, how come? Because it's going to take that long to raise money. It shouldn't. Not everybody can give a lot. But it shouldn't be that we've got to put these people on the deputation trail for two and three and four years. It should be. Let's just, let's just gather together. These are good people. They go to, come from a good college. They're after souls. Let's just decide. You don't even have to come to my church. Let's just give you money and get out of here. If God sent you overseas, get them out of here. They ain't doing no good sitting here. And send them over there and pray for them and support them and then stay here after people putting them in the pool. And then one day when we go to heaven, we'll get our rest. And we'll sit there and rejoice at the sheaves that we bring with us. Father, help us with this tonight. I sometimes think maybe I'm preaching to the choir with a message like this because I know the pastor's heart here. I know he is on this subject all the time. He has greater passion for it than hardly any preacher I've ever met. But yet sometimes maybe just reminder. Nobody else is going to do this work if you don't do it. We've got to get these missionaries out. We've got to do all we can in every way we can until we get out of here. Help us tonight, Lord. Reaffirm in our hearts and help us to rededicate our lives to putting people in the pool. For Jesus' sake, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I want us to stand tonight. I want you to get serious about this thing, taking tracks, giving tracks out, going out the soul winning times with the church. If for some reason your schedule doesn't allow that, I'll bet dollars to donuts if you came to your pastor and said, I can't make it on whatever night the soul winning is, but I can make it on this night, I'll bet you he'll find somebody to go with you. He ain't going to want you to go by yourself. He'll give you somebody. Let's just decide, though, we've got to do this. Because somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to care. Let's renew this to the Lord in the altar. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed as she plays the piano. Would you come? Would you find a spot and just pray for a few minutes? Say, Lord, I want to do more for getting people in the pool. I want to be more dedicated to it. I want to help. 
Maybe you haven't put a, a faith promise card in the plate yet and you're still praying about it. Maybe you could give a little more. So maybe another missionary could go, let's not make these people sweat this stuff out. Get them money and get them prayer and get them in their fields. And We ain't got much time. What if Jesus comes in two years? Should it take two years to get to the field? You can help. I believe everything your pastor says, I have said as a pastor, everybody can do something. You can do something. Let's do what we can with the gospel here and abroad. You come now. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.